Hello class, my name is Human Ziari, and this is my presentation on paying college athletes. Let's start off with who we are focusing on today, student athletes. The life of a student athlete is very tough. Sometimes they start off their days with a morning weight room session, followed up by maybe a film session, then some classes, and to finish it off with some gruesome practices. In this busy schedule, who has the time to do homework? or have a part-time job to support a family. In some cases, athletes are using sports as a way to get themselves and their family out of improvised areas and to make the community better for the next generation. This seems to be very tough when three or four years of their prime athletic years are spent playing a sport that doesn't even pay them, but instead that pays the school very handsomely. Most of these athletes quit by the end of their first season and the ones who are lucky enough to finish are granted with a degree. Most of those athletes who get a degree don't have a family to support and they're comfortable playing a sport they love while getting a nice education. There's nothing wrong with that, but that just puts some athletes in a disadvantage when they are also going through multiple jobs to support their families living back at home. That's where the scandals start showing up. In my view, Athletes who get paid will have a better reason to stay and finish their degrees in the college setting rather than opt out and go into prof professional leagues much sooner than they should. The NCAA says they are paying the athletes through free education, but most athletes have stated that with a busy schedule of being an athlete, they don't have the time to study for tests like other students do or, the, uh, or do that homework as soon as possible like we most students do. So the athletes have to work twice as hard just to pass the same classes and not enjoy the opportunity at a high, higher education. Even the school itself believed that the education is just for eligibility and not for academic reasons. I'm gonna show you a video here of a former D1 athlete, Richard Sherman, on the education student athletes receive. Great question. I really appreciate that question. Um, no, no, I don't think college athletes are given enough time to really take advantage of, of the free education that they're given. Um, and it's frustrating because because a lot of people say, you know, get get upset with student athletes and say that they're not focused on school and, and they're not taking advantage of, of the opportunity they're given. I would love for, for a regular student to, to have a student athlete schedule during the season for just, just one quarter or one semester and, and, and show me how you balance that. You know, show me how you would, you would schedule your classes when you can't schedule classes from, from two to six, six o'clock on any given day. You know, show me how you're gonna, gonna get all your work done when you, when after, you know, you get out at 7.30 or so, you got a test the next day, you're dead tired from practice and you still have to study just as hard as everybody else every day and get every, all the same work done. You know, most of these kids are, are, are done with school, you know, done with class by three o'clock, you got the rest of the day to do, do as you please. You know, and you, you're sitting here, you may, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you may spend a few hours studying, um, then you may sp spend a few hours at the library checking out books and just doing casual reading. Then you may go hang out with friends and have a coffee. And when you're a student athlete, you don't have that kind of time. You wake up in the morning, you have weights at this time. Then after weights, you go to class. And after class, you go, you go maybe try to grab your quick bite to eat. And then after you get your quick bite to eat, you go straight to meetings. And after meetings, you got practice. And after practice, you got to try to get all the work done you you had throughout the day you got from your from your lectures and and, and from your focus groups um and those aren't the things that people focus on when talking about student athletes they they're they're upset when a student athlete says they need a little cash um well i can tell you from from experience i had negative 40 bucks in my account and usually my account was in a negative more times than it was in a positive you know you gotta make decisions on whether you get gas for your car or whether you get the meal for the day. You know, what? You got one of the two choices. Um, and people think, oh, you, you, you're on scholarship. They pay for your room and board, they pay for your, your education, but to, to their knowledge, you're there to play football. You're not on scholarship for school. And it sounds crazy when a student athlete says that, but that's, that, those are the things coaches tell them every day. You're not on scholarship for, for, for school. And, you know, Luckily, I was I was I was blessed to go to Stanford and and a school that was that was primarily focused on academics. So it was a, it was a blessing. It was a it was a, a little bit better. Um, as, but Jim, as Jim Harbaugh would attest, we were also there for football. 
Uh, Richard Sherman makes some good points on student athletes. But let's move on a little bit from education to uh, corruption. We see a lot in this field. Recently, there has been huge cases of scandal being put to light. These cases are spawned around big sporting companies getting a jump on athletes, family members getting a head start on the money train, and assistant coaches getting a little something for themselves. There have even been cases of colleges using fake classes so that athletes have more time to play and give them a bit of a GPA booster so they'll be eligible to play. If athletes were paid, corruption, scandals, and all their investigations will all decline, giving the athlete, their family, and the school a better image. Here, I put a picture of um, a huge scan scandal that occurred a few years back on a football player who is in the NFL now. Mr. Todd Gurley was selling off some autographed pictures and mer merchandise for some pocket money. This guy I'm in huge trouble for just selling his own signature. Now, I don't see how the school and the NCAA has the rights to his personal signature. Before I start talking about the profits the NCAA make on, those, on these athletes, I want to highlight some big games during a normal year. First, there's March Madness, the playoffs of men's and women's college basketball. This year, there was a lot of stories of student athletes stealing the March Madness, Madness logo floor mats from their locker rooms, and then either using them in their dorm rooms or actually selling them. The players would say this was part of their compensation for bringing in such big revenue. The but then the NCAA got mad because they were, they were planning on auctioning off those mats after everything was done with, giving the NCAA more money in their pockets. Then we go into bowl games, sort of the playoffs and championship games of college football game. The bowl games are sponsored by various big corporations like Chick-fil-A, just like U of H was a couple of years back. Keep in mind, some of these bowl game, game ticket prices are double or triple NFL game ticket prices. Even then, the players aren't even getting paid at all for the great amount of revenue they're bringing for the NCAA and their school. Instead, they get a free trip, some free merchandise that was going to be given out from those big corporations anyway. Now let's move on to the profits. College athletics has become a huge industry in the last couple of decades, with sports like football, basketball, baseball and softball all of which have intensive schedules throughout the year, the year with playoffs and championship games even for some schools you find game tickets for the same price as professional league games from an la times article i read that the revenue of college sports programs has gone from 4 billion in 20, 2003 to 14 billion in 2018. that is a huge jump for just 15 years of uh, worse of seasons. That's not all. With a $14 billion industry, they're spending more on coaches' salaries than player scholarships. The whole system enriches broadcasters, apparel companies, and athletic departments all at the expense of athletes. From the same article, I read that coaches' coaches salaries come from 16% of the profit margin from the games and apparel that athletes play and sponsor, while the athlete scholarships are just at 13%. The numbers don't seem to add up, especially since everything is at the expense of the athletes. The most interesting note was the highest paid basketball coach's salary was $3.2 million, while the highest paid football coach's salary is $5.3 million this past season. All this money is coming from the athletes' performances, their injuries, their sacrifices, and majority of it goes into the pockets of the NCAA and coaches. Here, we have a picture of one of the best college football coaches of all time. Mr. Nick Saban here has been on three teams his whole career, starting with a college team, moving, on, moving up into the NFL, and then jumping back into the college world. In most eyes, that seems like a demotion but not to save him. He is on the track to be the highest paid coach, coach next season. 
his contract he just signed a new contract at a whopping 8.3 million dollars now we can see why he moved back down into the college world from the nfl let's put aside the fact that the colleges were also getting better in some cases if they paid their athletes for instance with less ncaa rules athletes and colleges will be able to get additional ads and sponsors the players will be more committed to the game, playing harder and better, all while more athletes will be jumping at the opportunity to play college ball. Just like it is now, larger schools will, with more money and scholarships will be getting the best talents, and the students will be more dedicated to school and the uh, school in general and the sports programs. One of the main aspects I do not like the NCAA is the money they are making from uh, the farm system. The NCAA and the NFL have a mutual understanding that college football is a farm system for the NFL. The farm system is basically like a semi-pro league, a chance for the athletes to dip a toe into the field. They're in other sport cases, athletes are getting paid very handsomely while being in the farm system. Will it either be the NBA or MLB? Those athletes are getting paid. But in the NFL and even NPF cases, those leagues are using college as a farm system to get out of paying for semi-pro athletes and while also priming those athletes at someone else's cost. Now, the NCAA doesn't seem to have too many happy fans at the moment. Even their own athletes aren't always happy with them and their rules. But by giving on one of the most controversial topics, paying the athletes, they'll be shining some positive light on themselves while also getting more and more recruits over the years. Even so, more sports fans will be keen on watching college games. Since they'll be a step closer to being actual professionals, and their hatred for the NCAA will have died down a good bit. I know mine would have. Now, there is a good bit of positive and negative aspects of paying student athletes. Let's start off with the negatives. By paying athletes, the sport balance will be more often than it already is. Everyone knows majority of the scholarships go into football and basketball. So other small sports will either pay their athletes very little, little or none at all. The athletes who are being paid will have less incentive to go to class since they already have a job. But then that's where NCAA rules come in and to play on GPA minimums and to be eligible to play. Lastly, women's athletes will be badly lowballed and at a huge disadvantage. Since their sports don't bring in as much revenue as football or men's basketball, they'll be playing for very low amounts of money or no money at all. This will be different though at bigger schools since they have more fan bases and money to go around. Moving on to the advantages. The advantages of paying student athletes have been outlined early in this presentation, but in conclusion, the players will be more committed to the game to the school and the program. The number of athletes in each class will rise knowing they'll have a chance to get paid once they play. The athletes who have jobs on the side will be able to focus more on school and sports. And a nest egg could be built for a young athletes in, in case they don't get into the professional leagues. Also, the NCAA will also be more likable and profitable. It seems like the pros outweigh the cons. So why has it taken so long for this to actually happen? I'm gonna show you another clip here from uh, Business Insider that will give us some light on the matter on how much the court system has intervened into this controversial topic and how the NCAA gets, with, gets away with what they do. Revenue reached $1 billion. Many people have argued that the players who drive this revenue don't receive the true value that they bring to their schools. There is nothing inherently wrong with a sporting tournament making huge amounts of money, but there is something slightly troubling about a billion dollar sports enterprise where the athletes are not paid a penny. 
John has a point. So why is it that student athletes aren't paid? Let's start by looking through recent lawsuits against the NCAA. In response to the release of EA Sports' popular NCAA video games, former UCLA basketball player Ed O'Bannon filed a federal lawsuit against the NCAA over whether Division I men's basketball and football players should be compensated for the commercial use of their names, images, and likenesses. After appeals, the final outcome was that even though the NCAA's amateurism rules are unlawful, the fact that it lets colleges compensate student athletes with the cost of college attendance, the NCAA frees itself from antitrust violations. And in March 2019, there was a slight change to that ruling. In the U.S. District Court, Judge Claudia Wilkin ruled to allow each conference and its member schools to provide additional education-related benefits without NCAA caps and prohibitions. Her ruling tethers payment to education. So instead of cash, student athletes will be allowed to receive computers or scholarships for postgraduate degrees. In each trial, the NCAA has argued that amateurism keeps it from becoming an anti-competitive trust. So, what is amateurism? In page 4 of the NCAA Division I handbook, under the heading, The Principle of Amateurism, the NCAA declares, Student athletes shall be amateurs in an intercollegiate sport, and their participation should be motivated primarily by education and by the physical, mental, and social benefits to be derived. To clarify that, Oliver Luck, the NCAA's former executive vice president of regulatory affairs, said in a speech in 2015, it would be a bad mistake to create campus employer-employee relationships with student athletes. Paying college athletes would distract in a very significant way from pursuing what they really need to pursue, an education. And we need to emphasize the value of that education. But let's think about that for a second. Are student athletes able to receive the full value of that education? No, I don't think college athletes are given enough time to really take advantage of uh, the free education that they're given. Former student athletes argue that the time commitment of playing a college sport, especially at the Division I level, impedes their ability to take advantage of their educational opportunity. Show me how you're gonna, gonna get all your work done when you when after you know you get out at 7.30 or so, you got to test the next day, you're dead tired from practice, and you still have to study just as hard as everybody else every day and get every, all the same work done. In fact, CBS Sports published a study on the topic with data from the Pac-12, the league Sherman competed in while at Stanford. The study surveyed 409 Pac-12 student athletes and found 54% of athletes say they don't have enough time to study for tests. 80% of athletes say they have missed a class for competition during the academic year. And overall, athletes spend 50 hours a week on athletics. And while student athletes feel they have the resources at their disposal to succeed academically, they don't have the time to do so. The university was moving on a little bit. But, promise, the cost of which is by law how they're compensated. But beyond that, the cost of that education is lower than the revenue most big school athletic departments bring in. In 2014, the 10 schools that made the most money in college sports averaged revenue that was $132.5 million more than the average those schools spent on scholarships. So you get a free ride at school, but you just serve so much more than that. The NCAA has been allowed to be the flaming hypocrites that they are, getting away with the multitude of things that they have gotten away with in an effort to exploit these kids for years and years and years. It's time to now pay players. In her latest ruling, Judge Wilkin denied a free market scholarship model. And the idea of paying student athletes raises a lot of questions. This video was one of my favorites I found. It really highlights the court system in this matter and other people's feelings on what the NCAA is doing. Lastly, I'm going to focus on the sociological impact of this issue. I've already talked about these bulletins, but here's a refresher. First, paying student athletes will impact upcoming athletes who are not sure if they want to play college sports. Athletes can make their communities better while also helping their families. Also, there will be better and brighter futures for athletes who get injured in college sports and wouldn't be able to play further. 
it'll have a little bit of a nest egg, like I said earlier. Thank you for watching my